So. All right, so in, in our session today, we'll be talking about the both the imperative to rethink peace processes or the international community's approach to peace and uh, what how we're trying to do that. Um, and I think in order to say, why do we need to rethink peace processes? We're going to unpack some of the key trends that we see, where we see there's fundamental flaws, where we see the failures, where we see the opportunities, and we'll go in a, in a methodical way. So first I will be starting with sharing with you some key trends and what we see around the world of conflict and peace um, globally. And then from there, we're going to go into unpacking the current flaws in the current system. And then we'll talk, I'll tell you about an exciting initiative, which is very open source and very um, participatory, which if you guys get inspired and ladies uh, get inspired about this, you just go ahead and, and, um, and, and contribute to it. And I'll tell you how to do that. So before we get into these, um, and I've been doing this course now, uh, this is the second time I do it. It's usually uh, like a few sessions of six hours I've been doing with the Sydney uh, University students and they're doing assignments, but I'm trying to, to squish it into a two hour. So we're not gonna go into the same depth, but let's, let's have a bit of a flavor together. Um, and the first notion I'd like you to think about is when we talk about conflict and peace, is it relatable for people living in different societies based on where you are? So in order just for us to, to, to examine this notion before I go into definitions, can you write down, like now, without thinking too much, the first two, thing, you know, two things or an image that come to your mind when you think about, when you hear the word peace? Is it a country? Is it a vision? Is it um, an object? Um, write it down. And then second, try to give a short definition of peace. And those who finish, start to put it in the chat. I'll, I'll keep an eye on the chat. And then we'll take a few interventions, uh, whoever would like to intervene. So the first image that comes to your mind when you think of peace or conflict, what is it? Sorry, do you want us to write the image that we have on peace or on conflict? Well, I'd like you to do both. Okay. But first think about the word peace. What, what was the first image? And then when you think about peace and conflict together, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Great, very interesting. Um, Anyone else would like to, would like to uh, any more, like another minute or you're good? OK, 
Okay, I don't see any requests for more time. All right, so it's very interesting to see what, what, uh, what's coming out from your, um, from your interventions. I'd like to call on some of you to come in and just elaborate a little bit more on, on, what, on what, you, um, what you wrote. Anyone would like to go voluntarily or should I just volunteer some of you to do it? Okay, I shall start to volunteer. Leonardo, tell us more. When, when you thought of peace, you thought of justice. Hello, I'm Leonardo. I studied international relations and, well, I had an experience in the Hague at the Italian embassy there. And there is this time I also worked a little bit uh, for the ICC, well, within the ICC, following the Italian expert uh, working there for the embassy. And during that period, I attended the, the meeting of all the state parties and they talked a lot about the problem of the, 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 the connection between justice and peace. For example, related to uh, countries where there were uh, civil conflict. And the problem was that, of course, victims of crimes was, were looking for justice. So the problem was guarantee peace in that country, but also justice mm -hmm. for people there. And the problem was that guaranteeing peace would divide the society. I don't know if I will explain okay. it. was very complex. No, 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 so you, you, I was really impressed about this problem. And this is why the first word I thought about was justice. <laughs> great. No, that's that's great. And then, um, well, I'm also interested to hear a bit more from Ricardo. Peace equals the absence of violence. Are you, ah, you're in the library, okay. So does that mean you can't talk? Okay, that's fine. Um, and then, okay, so I, I see quite a bit on, um, well, Anna, Anna Maria, can you tell us a little bit more on, uh, on the key points you've raised, solidarity, social and political cohesion? Yeah, what sure. Solidarity is, first of all, among uh, among people, for sure. And uh, I was thinking something uh, related with the ideas. So even though you have different ideas, it is needed to have solidarity among people. And uh, it's, uh, I don't know, it's something uh, implicitly related with uh, respect. Mm -hmm. And uh, regarding the social and political cohesion, I think is the, the first step in order to have peace. Great. All right, so I'm going to share with you my screen again. Uh, this is really um, great what you've uh, just shared with us. And we're gonna go through some, some key definitions. So when we talk about peace and peaceful societies, in, even in the, in the peace building field, actually the, the kind of definitions uh, that underpin both policies of peace building organizations, of, of international organizations, of, um, of uh, um, governments, you know, foreign policy varies. Uh, it's not like the same understanding of what do we actually mean by peace and what level of peace are we talking about. Um, essentially, one of the key definitions that is, is, is followed is to think about peace about being able to resolve, resolve conflict without violence. It's not really about the absence of conflict because it's natural for, um, for differences or conflicts to be there, to exist. The point is that do these then conflict, how the society deals with conflict, difference in opinions, different in views, different in understandings in violent or nonviolent ways. Conflict is not a bad thing if it's not re resulting in violence. And I think this is an important uh, distinctions. When we also talk about what do uh, peaceful societies mean, and I've had this conversation um, with um, with different, I mean, we, we've been doing consultations now, we've done around 250 in this initiative, talking to 
uh, people from different backgrounds, from different constituencies, to thousands of people around the world, uh, asking questions around what peace means to them. Um, and, and it's really interesting in countries where there is a lot of conflict, um, there's, they, they're not only thinking about it in terms, of, in terms of violence, but they're also thinking about it a lot in terms of the absence of inequalities that power these grievances and mistrust. And a notion that is, we often, we often see uh, emphasis on is trust. And this is common from, from Mali to Australia um, in terms of um, how people see trust as an important indicator of how peaceful or equal or just their society or not. And, and that's not a surprise because in so many ways, trust is that, is that thing that keeps the social fabric of the society closely, closely knitted. And um, when we see mistrust with state institutions or old power, that's when we see more um, uh, frustration amongst the populations. And when it comes to the, uh, the, the definitions around peace, it was really interesting uh, to, to hear you um, and see what, what you've also written. There's, the first definition is the def definition that Ricardo shared, which is what we call negative peace. And this notion of negative and positive peace was first introduced by this um, um, very good academic, um, um, Johan Galtung. And he did a lot of lit literature around when, when we talk about peace, what does it mean? And negative peace is mainly um, defined by the absence of war and violence. But what this definition of negative peace does not include it is looking really into the questions that both, for example, Anna Maria and Leonardo talked about in terms of um, the, the tendencies of stability and harmony within, within a society, the sense of justice, the sense, the sense of solidarity, the sense of social cohesion. And many of you talked about these keywords in your, in your um, suggestions or thoughts when you talk about um, conflict. And then there's a second definition which is positive peace. And positive peace is defined in a way that, um, that refers to the notion of thinking about what kind of peace would make it last. How do we build peace in a way that uh, creates a sustainable investment, both in economic development, in institution, in state institutions, in societal attitudes, in rebuilding the fabric of the society, in a way that actually can make the, the societies themselves resilient to falling into violence as a result of differences or conflict. Um, so in a way, the, what, what we often say is that positive peace is looking, not only looking at the violence, but it's looking at the structures and culture, uh, cultures of violence and trying to address this. And this is really a fundamental difference. Why am I telling you these positive and negative peace? Because it's very important that you keep that in mind when we're talking about, about peace. Because the, the approach to negative peace is what actually defines a lot of the problems that we see today in how the international community behaves. And let's look at Gaza right now, not just because I'm Palestinian, but let's look at what's happening in Gaza. The, the international community, and it, it's, it's messed up in so many ways. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get started about my, my frustration and emotions on that. But let's look at what happens in a situation like the situation in Gaza. The international community, of course, failure of the Security Council, unable to, to, to get a, a unified approach. And then you have a group of member states, especially the US, trying to intervene. What are they after? Negative peace, just in terms of um, a, an immediate cessation of hostilities. That's what we call negative peace. But that's not addressing any of the fundamental issues. So it's, it's going to recur again and again and again. That's why every four or five Years we have another episode of this. This is what also they focus on in, in the case of uh, the negotiations around, around ceasefires. So I want you to think about this concept, negative peace and positive peace. Negative peace is what drives the whole, what we call elite bargains approach to peace building, an approach that is focused mainly on political settlements that brings elite actors together. They, ne they negotiate on the basis of a power sharing arrangement, and then they take off. And they're not as concerned with actually addressing the root causes, going into the historical grievances, looking at how do we make a society heal, 
looking at how do we actually provide them with both the economic and social dividends that would help them function. And this, this, this dichotomy between these two approaches and two understandings of peace drives how the UN designs their stabilization missions, how um, the US in, invested in Afghanistan for 20 years uh, after wrecking it um, with quick wins, stabilization missions over 470 billion uh, invested in stabilization. And every it's very, very short term and does not necessarily do anything in the long term. And now we, we see where Afghanistan is at the brink of complete recollapse after the, the upcoming withdrawal. So, so these notions are very, very important to keep in mind. So, so how are we doing globally? Uh, by the way, because of my screen view, I can't see if you're, for some reason, I can't see if you're typing something. So if someone have a question, can I just invite you to uh, interrupt me? Uh, and just go, um, you know, unmute yourself and just come in. I'm really comfortable with that. It won't throw me off <laughs> uh, center. So just feel free to do that, okay? All right, wonderful. So, um, so I thought now what we'll do is just share with you um, some of the key trends in the in the that we see around us around the world which substantiate the claim that i made in the very beginning that we actually need to rethink uh, our international approach to peace making and peace building so let's look at trends around um, violent conflict what we see in the past three decades is uh, is an upward trend we see more violence uh, we see more active conflicts. I mean, to, in 2019, the end of 2019, there were 54 active conflicts. Um, and what we see is that um, there are more armed conflicts that in the last decade that started than, than armed conflicts that ended. Um, and that's a, that's a very uh, worrying trend. I mean, that's a very concrete evidence of the failure of the system to resolve conflict or reduce it. It's very important to, uh, to link that then seeing, okay, so if there's more violent conflict that is, um, that is erupting, that is resolved, then how also that links to conflict recurrence. But we'll talk about it in a moment. So what we see is truly a historic trend uh, that is going downwards when it comes to peace. We see more internal uh, conflicts and more uh, non-state actors rising. At one point, you could, we could talk in the uh, covered Syria for a long time, and it was absolutely impossible to, to even account, even the UN Special Envoy Office could not account for how many non-state actors were there in Libya. It was absolutely impossible. This is, of course, a very um, worrying trend um, we see more and more non-state actor conflict and violence happening in different times. I mean, you have rise in militias in, in uh, organized political violence. We also see um, uh, state security forces cracking down. This is a trend that we see in, in many countries. I mean, you can see that even, um, you know, last year in, in France with the, with the Yellow Vest movement, you know, there were times when it looked really, uh, you know, quite uh, over the top. And also another trend is around the, the refugees and IDPs, which continue to climb with over 79 million people uh, being refugees. Now, if we think about that, and then we look at another um, important factor, is that this trend is not only um, problematic because of um, the level of eruption, actually conflicts are becoming much longer in duration as well. And this, this trend here, you can see how, how it's been going, but it's a, it's a steady up. But the average duration of conflicts increased uh, from 9.7 years in the, in the 80s to almost 14 years. And I think, of course, there are a number of conflicts which, um, which also has gone much longer. But this also relates to the effectiveness of our assumption of how response, how stabilization missions should function, how the humanitarian assistance should be designed. Everything is designed on a very short uh, time, time span. But the reality is that conflicts are definitely increasing in duration. They are becoming more complex. 
um, there are a lot more um, armed, group, armed groups in, in, in civil war that we see. And it's been a, a steady up. Um, we see remote violence in rural areas. I mean, if you look at the, the situation in the Sahel, uh, it's a very clear, um, I mean, even the shift of, for example, the ISIS um, impact from the Middle East to, uh, to the Sahel, it, it's something that is really worrying. It's very unpredictable. And then we, we live in a world that is multipolar uh, with great power competition. And we're seeing more and more proxy conflict to talk about conflict, conflict complexity. Um, I mean, it was a common thing to have um, uh, so, you know, the, the competition between the Soviet Union and, and the US during the, the Cold War. But what we are seeing more and more is that regional powers now are intervening in violent conflicts for influence and, and uh, I mean, Syria is probably the most visible uh, for a while uh, in terms of how it became a battleground uh, for the Sunni uh, Shia, the, uh, the Russian US, Yemen is another interesting one. So this just adds to the complexity, which again renders the traditional approach of 50 years ago of how do we resolve conflict and think about peace quite, um, completely obsolete. Um, also the, the issue around conflict recurrence, what we, what we see in different countries uh, around the world and to substantiate that number I've told you before, the 54 armed conflicts ongoing, um, what we see is that on average, peace lasts only seven years after a conflict ends. So when there's a, a peace agreement, um, on average, there could be peace of uh, seven years when, when they're claiming it to be a bit more a comprehensive agreement. We're not talking about ceasefires. But what we see uh, in different countries is that almost half occur. So if, it, again, they recur. So if there's a conflict, there's a peace agreement, then it erupts. In fact, 90% of conflicts that happened in the last decades were happening in, in countries uh, that have experienced at least one civil war before, which is a sign that we have not managed to realize positive peace. What we've managed to achieve is a negative peace. It's a cessation of hostilities and end to the violence, but we haven't addressed the root causes. So the other thing that we see in different, um, I mean, based on the analysis and review of the different peace processes is the fact that this era of comprehensive peace agreement is seemingly over. That was the golden age of the UN in you know, of, of bringing the, the warring parties around the negotiation table and brokering um, an agreement uh, through uh, international mediation. Um, but this has not necessarily uh, the case anymore. We're seeing less and less uh, success of this approach of, uh, of uh, comprehensive agreement. You know, Bosnia, for example, was one that was deemed to be um, a, 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 you know, a comprehensive agreement, but then it reignited into another uh, series of conflicts, DRC, Somalia, Sudan, you know, we can count so, so many. But essentially, uh, what we know is that the, the era of comprehensive agreements that are mediated by the UN in the way that they used to be designed is seemingly over. Another factor to keep in mind is the fact that we are uh, living in a changing world. Um, we have a significant demographic change. The world is growing younger. And uh, with this 1.8 billion young people in the world, 90% of these are actually in developing countries. And where, which is really important because if you think about the pressure cooker effect in terms of frustrations and grievances, and some of you talked about uh, opportunities or um, um, the sense of population feeling that they have options and prospects and how that drives the sense of injustice or inequality is, is quite significant. And what we see is that with this, the world growing younger, this is an important factor in how we think about um, conflict and, and peace. Another thing that is co completely uh, uh, fascinating is the rise of new power. Um, and we see uh, genuinely 2019 saw a historic number of pro-democracy movements. It was absolutely 
fascinating to see it. Um, and I don't know how much you, you were watching the news then, but it was everywhere. It was from Haiti to Chile to Mali to France to Lebanon. It was constantly every day we were switching on the news and you'd just see massive, massive demonstrations. Of course, you know, the Arab Spring was a moment, but I'm talking really about 2019 as just before COVID. It was absolutely fascinating to see that. And against this backdrop of the sense of activism that we can thank the younger population for, that there's more desire to speak out and call out injustice, what we see in contrast, uh, a democratic space that is, is increasingly uh, under challenge. We're seeing more intervention from autocratic governments to reduce the scope for civil society. They try to limit the rights of protests. We see pressure on academia. And that's something that is very interesting because it's not only in developing countries. There's a, there's a greater limitations on freedom and censorship. And, it, and it's been interesting to see also how COVID enabled further uh, more government intervention in this space. Then also another important uh, factor that has been changing for us to rethink that we need to rethink our approach to, to peace is, is around technology. With more information, there are also rising expectations, but also it creates a whole sense. If you, if you think about it this way, we have a lot more young people who feel a sense of frustration in different countries about different things, but there is a common sense of frustration um, you know, from the Black Lives Matters in the US to um, um, you know, what's happening, for example, in, in, some of the, in some of the countries where you feel completely lack of prospects and insecurity and lack of social mobility uh, to uh, youth in, in, for example, demonstrations that we've seen even lately in Australia around um, gender-based violence and sexism and racism. I mean, you, you see that really, really increasing and young people have a bit less patience and higher expectations. And then you see a rising information that both can be a positive thing, but can be also a polarizing factor. We're seeing a historic number of pro-democracy movement. We're seeing also a, a crackdown, a less desire to open avenues of participation. You can see the you can see this this pressure, right? It's 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 coming from from different. Uh, so so the look is one of of uh, quite <laughs> risk. Uh, at, at many levels. Um, anyway, I'm going to move a little bit faster because I'm taking quite a lot of time. Another one, uh, another trend that is really worth keeping in mind is what we see in different parts of the world is, is a growing lack of trust in key actors. Um, and actually, COVID-19 has played such a, a big, big role. And if you look at these, um, at these trends, it's, it's really interesting how some of the most powerful countries uh, lose uh, significantly on, the, on their uh, trust capital. And it was around their handling of the pandemic and their handling of information. So, you know, you see Germany, the UK, the US, China. It's, it's, uh, that's really, really important because we've talked about that before in the idea of negative peace and positive peace, that trust is that glue, right? That when, when it starts to go and erodes, it creates a, a situation. Uh, where um, susceptibility to, to violence becomes higher. And also important thing to see is that when we think about the positive peace definition that we've talked before, we see a decline of that in the, in the US and China. Because if you think about the US, I mean, the insurrection that happened in January in the US is a very strong display of the fragility and the level of polarization in the US and how deeply flawed the dealing with these underlying differences and schisms that are there at the heart of at the heart of the society and we can we can talk a lot about uh, China but I'll leave this presentation with you later so it'll be good for you just to take a look if you're interested into the different indicators of how do we actually measure positive peace um, this is just a, a visual for you to see how you know, the level of polarization, for example, in a country like the US, because people think of when we think of conflict and peace, they think of, you know, 
war-torn countries and they think less of, uh, of developed countries that are not necessarily actively violent countries in terms of conflict in the traditional definition. But this is why I was keen on you thinking about the positive peace definition, because on that basis, you can see the level of polarization. If you look at 1994, you see, for example, the Republican and Democrat, um, you know, of course there's differences, but there's quite a lot in the center in between in terms of divergence. But if you look, and if, if we actually, I, I could not get this, these numbers for 2020, this, this polarization is much, 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 much larger. And when you have that, even in, in countries that have impact around the world, it's, it's actually quite uh, dangerous. Anyway, so let me skip this because it's, it's, it's quite long. So I'm going to pause here before I go into the conceptual framework, but essentially what I wanted to do with this is to communicate three things actually. One, that we have a changing world where power, um, the definition of power is changing, the actors are changing, the nature of conflict is changing, there are new forms of power, um, there is more access to information, there's more sense of activism, there's a shrinking democratic space, and then we're seeing rising conflict becoming more complex, more prolonged, more recurrent. But then on the other hand, we have an international system that has not evolved in the past 50 years. The way, you know, the way the system was designed has not changed. It's exactly the same, you know, we have the Security Council, we have, you know, the playbook, the toolbox of the international community is exactly the same. We have every evidence that the, the, the old approaches are not working, but it, the, the system is still the same. And this is, this, is the, this is why we thought that we need to do something about it. And this is why we've designed this, um, this initiative. So I'll, I'll dig a little bit deeper into that in a moment. Uh, but I, I would like to pause here and just get, see if anyone has any quick reactions, anything from what you've heard that surprised you, that you thought, I didn't think that that was the case or um, that talked to you and resonated with you. Um, so maybe let's take just a few interventions and reflections, and then we'll go to our second part. May I? Can you hear me? Of course, please. Yes. No, because I have some <laughs> problem for connection. Uh, no, I was thinking about um, information, <clears throat> and we were talking about youth people that are more and the access to information but i was thinking about the can, can we talk about informal information yeah can you can you elaborate uh, anna maria what do you mean by informal information <clears throat> uh connecting with the fact that we are more young people than uh, elderly one uh, and we are more and more using um uh, social uh, networks so for example in my in my case i can reach more information from people around that and not from uh, formal information no? formal informative actors you're absolutely right and actually that's what i was um talking about in terms of increasing access to information and you know, yesterday I was actually in a discussion with the uh, EPFL here, the, the university in, in Lausanne, which has an amazing peace for, um, tech for peace center. And we were discussing that with a group of journalists and uh, peace builders. And you know, it, it comes with its positive um, and negative. I think I'm a huge fan of seeing people having access to information beyond, beyond the, the formal center. And, 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 and then just again, taking my, my, my personal, probably Ali might uh, agree with me. I'd be keen to hear from you, Ali, what you think. But let's take, because it's still in our current memory and it's been in the news, let's take what's, what's ha what was happening in Gaza. You know, if you follow like the official line, which used to be for many years, for example, in the US, you would only hear the statements 
quoted of, of um, you know, Biden, Israel has a right to defend itself. And, and then, you know, you, we call on all parties to, 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 to halt. And, um, and then you really don't necessarily, if, if, if a certain media source and a certain government has a certain position, you don't necessarily hear or get a sense of what's happening. Right now, I think the fundamental difference this time is, is actually the fact that um, there was such strong use of social media on both parties, huh? on both sides. I'm not saying that. Um, and in, in so many ways, it, it, it kind of allowed people to see again that it was not only the position of their governments, they could also make their minds. They could see, of course, that there were casualties in Israel and there's suffering and there's fear among you know, Israeli citizens, which is not something that anyone would support. But at the same time, they could see that there are 200 people killed in Gaza, that you, know, you have a, a military capability of a, of a state that can actually wipe the whole area in, in no time at all, versus like these firecrackers that Hamas are, are throwing, which can be intercept, intercepted. So the, the disproportionality of how do you present something informal news are having actually the opportunity for people to have access. That's the good part, right? The bad part is that also, you can, I can think of so many examples in this, in this situation and other, where that was deployed in a, in a very negative way. And if you think about the impact of social media in, in the US with, you know, with the Trump, um, you know, the, the Democrats and Republicans, the level of polarization and demonization, how that was fed this is, this is a very dangerous thing, actually. And there's a lot, and I'm really interested. Recently, I'm developing a partnership with a, with a number of um, experts in this area because I'm really interested to see it. Because if your focus, if your tendencies are in certain direction, it's not that you're getting the feed that is actually balancing your views. There's a certain level of tunneling further in your space and then it starts you know the algorithms start to give you more and more and more and then it makes it a bit more entrenched and my friends i've lived in new york for six years uh, when i was working with the un and i have a lot of american friends on both sides you know democrats and republicans and, and both are lovely people but the way that my republican friends talk about my democrat friends and my democrat friends talk about my republican friends it's like they're enemies and a big part of that is how much also social media fed that. So it's a good thing. It's, it, you know, as everything can be a force for good, a force for bad. But definitely it is a, it means that the world is changing. Access to information is changing. So you're absolutely right, uh, Anna Maria, about this. It, it's, a, it's a very important um, changing factor. And this is also what drives the sense of activism. And I think there's also a very interesting thing. Actually, Deloitte did a really interesting study about millennials because everyone was moaning about millennials, that millennials, you know, it's an entitled uh, generation and they're a terrible workforce. Um, they, they quit their jobs so quickly. I mean, really, it, it was going on for a long, long time. And then Deloitte did the study about millennials. And 65%, um, and I love that, 65% of those interviewed, they were asked, what's the primary purpose of business? Usually, like the older generation would say profit. They said positive impact on society. And this is going to drive such a shift in how corporations, because currently the biggest transfer of wealth is happening actually from baby boomers to, to millennials, that actually this is going to drive their investment decisions. So now out of self-preservation, businesses are rethinking how they can show a positive environmental um, and, um, and uh, social impact. I'm not going on a tangent, by the way, but this is important just to show you how expectations can shift policy, how new power can shift old power, how the force of mobilization can influence that. This is why like this, our new uh, initiative is actually a bit revolutionary in that way, that we're not only playing with the old power, we're actually trying to mobilize new power to shift old power. Um, but it's a very important notion. Anyway, I'll stop here. We'll take another few interventions before we go to the second part of uh, the presentation. May I ask, um, or actually, 
I mean, there is a question, but there's also a comment based on what you were saying. Something that struck me while you were talking about the um, uh, these changing factors was the um, dispolarization in the US policy. Um, but also, um, I can see it somehow, like I, I was recently talking about it with a colleague actually, um, also related to Italy and the um, this this change in the perception of what what's the purpose even in politics what do we have to do uh what um what how can we help and it seems like because of this polarization these uh, maybe uh politicians coming from two different parties um tend to propose change based on the opposition on what the other party has said so instead of, uh, for instance, um, I don't know, like migration is a, um, a pushing issue in Italy at the moment, and it's been like that for years, uh, it feels like the, the right is uh, answering, getting back at the left, if we can still use these terms, uh, based on like they're arguing against them or proposing some change that would be in opposition of what the left has said just to create this dichotomy and this binary of conflict with, between themselves. Um, and I was just wondering whether you can see or you have experienced that in the UN system as itself, because for instance, I've done um, model United Nations at university and we emulated the General Assembly and we wanted to propose some change. And to me, it was shocking to see how the emulation of this, like I thought at first, I was I thought it was a joke. I didn't really think it was actually the way that uh, in the UN you you actually bring about change. Uh, but everybody's just caring about their business, basically. Um, and uh, so, I don't know. Do you think this change in 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 through history? can also be, a, because you mentioned that the UN, UN system hasn't changed in these 50 years, but can it also be because of this, uh, if we want to translate in terms of politics, uh, do you see that happening or can you have you experienced that? I, I don't, I can hear you. These are great reflections. You know, what people often um, uh, forget is that the UN is its member states. So what, what happens in the, you know, in terms of power competition uh, between different states, all becomes on display when it comes to these kind of negotiations. And these negotiations can be on anything. So what you're experiencing in the General Assembly is exactly in the model um, United Nations. Um, and my son have just fin finished doing two years of that. Um, and him and I discussed it a lot together. And he used to be like, but it was like a joke. And I'm like, yeah, it is like that. You know, don't, don't be surprised. You do have regional groupings that dig their heels on certain areas. At one point, in, I'll give you a very concrete example. In the Commission on the Status of Women, okay? There was, it, one of the themes was on ending violence against women. And there, there was one paragraph around reproductive health and rights, okay? Now, I'm going to tell you one of the constellation of interest groups that came together to block it saw an alliance between Saudi Arabia, Iran, Russia, the Holy See, because they have an, uh, uh, you know, a sea, and I can go on with a few. But I mean, just listen about the absurdities of these. When would Saudi Arabia and Iran ever agree on anything? When would Saudi Arabia and Iran and the Holy See ever agree on anything? And when do, you know, it, it was absolutely, absolutely fascinating, but it's a display of also the, the dysfunctionality of the system. The same with, with the Security Council. The fact that, for example, um, the, the, even the call for the ceasefire in Gaza recently was just repeatedly blocked by the US who were calling for a ceasefire outside, but they didn't want it to go through, through the Security Council. So it renders it, it renders it obsolete. So yeah, you're absolutely right. These these power competition play out and in the system, and they they put put it to become completely obsolete and handicapped. 
I also see a comment from Ricardo in the in the message in the message, and and um, he he's making a very important point. He's saying. Uh, if you do not have access to proper education, it's a form of violence. If you do not have access to health, it's some form of violence. Guarantee of basic um, rights are all fo forms of guarantee for peace. Um, you know, uh, Ricardo, we've just finished a consultation in um, a series of consultations in Afghanistan. And just to confirm the points that you were you were talking uh, you're talking about, one of the key things that came out from people of different age groups was that the, the failure of the international system was that they were mainly focusing on political peace. So in the in the stabilization, it was always talking about just the state institutions. How do you actually bring in, you know, the, the, the Taliban and the, the new government into negotiations? And very little focus was on social peace. And the way they define social peace is a lot like how you're defining it right now. These are important foundations. And they were saying for peace to, hold, to have held in Afghanistan, there should have been a proper investment in social peace. Uh, so yes, very much agree with you. I think these are very important issues and issues that often the current approach, as we will talk about in a moment, does not look enough on. So unless there's someone with having a burning uh, question, perhaps I can move to the second part of my presentation. I have a question following the Clelia's comment. Uh, I'm Jolaina, I'm from Nicaragua. And this is the question. In an internal conflict, do you think that the first step is to try to solve the problem between national actors? Um, in a, in a national... Sorry, can you can you repeat again? In a national conflict or in, in an international conflict? I didn't hear. Inter, that yes, national country. Okay. All right. Well, look. I mean, <laughs> that's a that's a that's a very interesting question. Um, one one big part is there is usually a moral imperative when violence is completely has completely erupted to bring an end to the bloodshed so the the moral imperative of potentially having some external partners come in external mediation mediators if that internal mediation capacity is not there because naturally there's a conflict in the country to bring in an immediate cessation of hostilities is an important starting point to start to engage the problem which we'll talk about in a moment is that that attention span is so short that very in very few times is it done in a way that lays the foundation for addressing the differences and the historical grievances and and addressing the root causes of the conflict. So we're kind of just putting a lid on you know a very boiling, overflowing pot that is you know the lid is just gonna you know at any moment erupt and and everything is gonna spill out. Uh, but for sure, the immediate, the immediate initial um, response when already there is violence is to try and bring a cessation of hostilities and lay the foundations for, uh, for engagement. But also, uh, there is a responsibility not to let it to get there. And this is where the importance of prevention. Um, and there's a lot that can be done. It's not like we, you know, we cannot anticipate that the conflict is going to occur in this country. You always see it. There are clear indications of it, uh, and there's so many indicators in terms of uh, in terms of economic indicators and social indicators and trust indicators that you can see actually that this country is a fragile country. I mean, if you look at the lists of fragile countries, you'll you, you'll see which ones they are. The International Crisis Group, for example, publish every year the the countries to watch because you know of this factor or that factor. So we can't say we don't we don't know that they're at the risk of eruption. Uh, but it's always intervention when it's a bit too late. Okay, anyway, I think we're starting to get into the into my second part of the presentation. So if you're okay, we're just going to move back to that. And then we'll have another round once I finish it. This will be, I think, a, a faster part of my presentation. Okay. So we've talked about this, uh, the premise that I've mentioned to you. Um, based on, oh, why am I being transcribed? Awful, okay. No. 
I'm stopping. Um, that we believe that existing approaches to peace are not fit for purpose based on what we've all the indicators that we saw. And that um, with these indicators around the, the how peace processes are failing, we definitely need to do something about it. So we've went into one level deeper when we've designed this initiative, the, what we call the Principles for Peace initiative, to say, okay, so what are some of the common and fundamental flaws when we look at peace processes that we often see in different countries? And we've built our theory of change around seven fundamental flaws that we were trying, we're trying to address. And these are very common from you know, thinking about the process in Colombia to thinking about the process in Mali to thinking about uh, even the peace process in Northern Ireland, the Good Friday Agreement, or I can go on and on and on. The first common uh, flaw that we see often in the international community's approach is that they are too focused on conflict resolution rather than on sustainable peace. And i.e. they're too focused on negative peace and not focused on positive peace. And this is very often. And th with this, actually, this is this is a big part of it is associated with the short time uh, interest and, and time span and attention span of international actors around different, different crises. Uh, the second fundamental flaw is how excessively externally driven and lacking in inclusivity. Um, I touched upon this shortly earlier. What we see, the current system, uh, and, and none of you answered this when I've asked you about what, what's the first image, but a lot of my, uh, when I've done this with Syrians, when I ask them, when you think of a peace process or peace, what's the first image that comes to your mind? And uh, quite a few of them said, a group of men in suits sitting around the table. Because in a way, uh, the Cairn system, uh, in, in the way the mediation processes are conducted in many ways, are essentially elite bargains. They bring in the elite uh, actors who are representing those who are holding the guns. Um, and what they try to negotiate naturally is a power sharing arrangement. This is what we call elite bargains. And you have two schools. You have the schools of thoughts of, of the you know, hard line uh, type of um, pragmatists in like in France or in, in Germany or who, who come with a very pragmatic approach and saying, look, we, we, elite bargains is what works because you need to bring in the people around around the table who are holding the guns. But what the problem is with this approach is that this become, makes violence the main currency. So if we think about South Sudan, um, what, what was very clear is that, you know, when, when this arrangement brought in the key warring parties, uh, violence went down in the urban areas and those who did not make it, other groups, violent groups who did not make it to the negotiation table up their games in, in rural areas so they could earn themselves a place on the negotiation table so they can own, so they can be part of cutting the cake. So what happens here is that with this approach of this heavily uh, 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 exclusive um, power sharing political settlement approach, what we see is that violence becomes the main currency. And also we often see that uh, women are not represented young people are not represented, and they're some of the strongest constituency for actually a, a peaceful solution to the, to the conflict. And because they want prospects, they want, um, they have different kind of demands. The third fundamental flaw is this heavy fixation on the negotiation at the table. It's like, it's the, it's the, it's the aspiration of every foreign politician to have a photo up with the negotiation table that they have negotiated they've managed to negotiate something. I don't know if, if any of you ever watched this um, TV show on Netflix, Borgen, which is about Danish politics, which I didn't think I was gonna find it that interesting, but it was like my binge watching when I really don't want to think about anything and I can't find anything more interesting to watch. And they had the most surreal episode where they actually talked about uh, the prime minister wanted something to save her career. so she went uh, to try and, and negotiate a ceasefire 
uh, in this fictional land and she just brought them to, to Denmark. And it was just actually, it was so realistic because this is what happened. It's about this fixation of let's create a negotiation table and bring people around it. And the fourth problem is around the lack of implementation oversight. So once a negotiation is completed and there's an agreement, everyone takes off and the, the attention span stops. And what we see is that a third of these agreements are never implemented. 80% today of the agreement in Mali is not implemented. Colombia, the peace agreement is not implemented on so many fronts. And that's what, drives, what, what creates further um, frustration. And then often we see that these peace processes do not uh, go deep enough in, in addressing the root causes or, or underlying grievances that drive conflict so it make it more recurrent. They, don't, they fail to understand also the political economy of the conflict, i.e. Who, who has vested interest in the continuation of, of certain economy, of certain conflict, who's benefiting from the economy of war. Often they overlook that. And finally, the strategic deficit in the international peace and security interventions, a system that is designed 50 years ago that has not evolved, that does not account to, the, to changing power balance of different countries, the changing nature of conflict, and the, the changing nature of this uh, proxy power competition. So what, what, we, what we're trying to do, we're saying with this, um, we set up this uh, initiative, which um, you know, I left the UN to, to join as a, an independent initiative with three main objectives. The first one, is really to create almost a movement, um, both of practitioners, of policymakers, and get a, a group of member states with us to develop um, a new set of principles uh, and norms on how to structure and sequence peace processes. In a way, I don't know if you all know about the Geneva Convention. You probably it's probably been covered in, in one of the previous courses that you've done, um, which guide the conducts of states in times of war. Uh, you have also the humanitarian principles. I know you usually have a visiting lecturer who talks about um, international humanitarian law. The, the, these provide a common grammar, you know, a frame of reference. Can you believe that there's nothing like that around peace in terms of how, what's the frame of reference that says this is a principle that, that states who are going engaging in a process of mediation should, should adhere to? So what we're trying to do is actually create a process that sets these principles that create that common frame of reference, that grammar, uh, that then allow us to call out when there's violations of them. It doesn't mean that they will not be violated, but it will allow us to do so. And the second one is really to, to with this uh, approach is to create this greater accountability and to work on shifting incentive, incentives, the twisted incentives, I call them. And I'll illustrate why that is important. Um, you know, when you're, when you're a hammer, everything you see is a nail. And um, when I was uh, heading an office in Iraq, I would sit in the humanitarian country team and be part of the humanitarian planning. And I would sit in the stabilization uh, discussions. And what happens is that you just start to negotiate for your mandate because you know everyone is just pushing for the projects that result in the uh, that that relates to their to their mandates. Um, so what we see uh, when I did a, a headquarters job uh, on the humanitarian side, what I started to notice very very clearly that you can take the humanitarian response plan for DRC, and then take the humanitarian response plan for Yemen, and then take uh, another one for um, any other country from any other region. Beside the situation analysis, the interventions always look the same. It's the, set, the, the clusters look the same, the kind of uh, initiatives look the same because it is pretty much mandate driven. And that's a really uh, big, a big issue. So what we're trying to do is to try and shift these in incentives, to shift institutional behavior so we get towards more coherence to become more problem driven rather than mandate driven. How are we going to do that? We've actually set up um, um, four key building blocks, uh, a process um, that, will, that will drive them. It's designed in a way that talks to old power, but also harness the energy of, of new power. So to talk to old power, we've actually set up an international commission uh, on inclusive peace, which brings together um, imminent persons, and I'll show you who they are. 
to drive a global participatory process to, to develop these set of principles. The idea of international commissions is very common in the old world mind. You know, there, there was an international commission on intervention and state sovereignty, which came up with a paradigm for the responsibility to protect, which is actually a really, really important paradigm. There were some competitions, some commissions which did not come up with something groundbreaking, but it's 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 a formula that allows us to engage with old power institutions in a way that is interesting uh, and can shift um, and, and put the legitimacy uh, behind these set of principles. But what's what's interesting in this initiative is that that's one building block, but we have other building blocks that are really important, which are these two. Uh, darker blue ones are the participation. Um, what we're trying to do here is really to amplify local voices and aspirations and bring that to shape what kind of principles, what do people think about peace, what should it mean to them, and how that should guide the national community's approach uh, to peacemaking and peace building. And we will have a, a group of local and regional consultations. We've had, I think, now a large number, of, over 100 already. Um, and then we are anchoring it in thematic research and evidence-based advocacy, because we need to be able to speak both to the hearts and minds of people. And, um, and evidence is a very important aspect of changing policy calculus, um, especially with some policymakers who would only want to look at hard empirical evidence. So this is the International Commission. We launched them actually. Um, I had the Secretariat, which, which works with this International Commission and runs all the different building blocks. And they come from different backgrounds. Many of them, um, General Romeo Dallaire is, an, is, is, a, is an icon. Uh, he was a force commander in Rwanda at the time of genocide who, who, who broke the, the orders of the UN and spoke out and wanted to protect civilians. So in the eyes of many, he's, a, he's an icon and a hero. Um, um, Ilwad Ilman is a, is a fantastic um, peace building activist in Somalia who, whose father was assassinated while he was working in, uh, on peace and, and peace building in Somalia. And she, she, she was in exile in Canada and then she came back to Somalia and she's working with GBV victims. And then we have you know, the ex-foreign minister and two times UN special representative for Ivory Coast and Mali like Bert Kunders or the interfaith dialogue person like Prince Ghazi or the ex-UK development minister like Rory Stewart. Anyway, the idea is that this international commission is going, is now engaging in a, in a global participatory process and they are functioning as a listening commission to uh, also amplify local voices and position these local perspectives uh, at the center of the global debate. So what we're trying to do in our approach is bring in real politic and real society, old power and new power, and trying to, to shift old power by also bringing strong bottom-up pressure. So on this amplifying local voices, I mean, this could be interesting for you in, in the case of, uh, you know, my students in, um, in Australia, because we have a whole, um, like, it's a two course, uh, two month module they actually have conducted country consultations in on campus. So they've done campus consultations around what peace um, means to, in, in the context of Australia, what should it deliver and what kind of principles should be as, as part of that. And it was really interesting because you know, there was a lot of insights around also the, the, the underlying, uh, the sense of, uh, social inequality and social injustice in Australia with the discrimination, for example, vis-a-vis -vis the Aboriginal uh, population. Um, so, so, the, so some really interesting insights uh, coming from their youth also are doing that um, in um, youth volunteers are doing that um, in the UK, in Germany, beside the developed countries, because we have this also in crisis countries, but we want to hear from young people from different parts of the world. So they're doing it on on campuses in, in different uh, forms. And then we have the more formal country consultations, which are an action research type of method that is reaching thousands of people through, through a web of partners. We have almost 27 organizations now that are part of this, including some UN agencies, funnily enough, who joined us to, to criticize them as well, um, or to criticize the approach. 
So yeah, these consultations are happening in 25 countries. Um, these ones that you see here are currently ongoing, but there will be a lot more as well in the north. Um, and then we, you know, on the evidence side, uh, what we're trying to do right now is really to create, uh, as we're as we're collating a huge amount of of research and evidence on what works and what does not work in peace processes, um, is really to create an in, almost an enduring knowledge base that is open and available both for peace building and peace make, uh, peace builders and peacemakers um, that they can build on, uh, but also that we somehow manage through this process of engagement to bridge this gap that we see between the scholarly research and the practice in the field, uh, which are quite, quite significant. And I'll tell you more about that because I think you know, many of you will go down either the practitioner um, road and you'll go to the field and go to some NGO, some of you will go to, to the UN, others might join think tanks. And I think I, I'd like you just to keep in mind no matter where you go in these, that um, we need to, to be very conscious of the balance and, and bridging the gap between what we see emerging from what we empirically know um, and what gets done in the field, uh, which, which is really very, very different, what it, very different. Also what we empirically know and what uh, and the kind of calculus of decision makers because they are not we are not using enough evidence to try and influence their decision making. So what we're trying to do here actually is also as we're anchoring our work um, in evidence and participation is is really to try and and bridge some key uh, research practice gaps that we see in, in, different, in different parts of, uh, or in, the, in, in different practices with the fact that, you know, if you ever work actually in a, in a think tank, just be that voice. I, I tend to do that now uh, here at Interpeace uh, with my colleagues who work on research, just to remind them that when, when evidence is too dense and hard to access, it goes unread because people don't have time and pe people in positions of influence do not have desire to read very dense documents. So if, if you want to influence policy, whatever thick uh, research you've done, you always should have a very short um, uh, synopsis of what actually you're trying to shift and what's the, what's the quantitative and qualitative evidence that underpins these kind of recommendations. Uh, also, what we're trying to, uh, to address is this um, significant bias that we see that we tend to study as an international community, we tend to study conflict more than we study peace. So you'd find so many case studies, for example, about South Sudan, about um, uh, Mali, about uh, DRC, but you don't really see us studying as much why, for example, a specific country that has some of the key ingredients that should make it fall into conflict, but it hasn't. We don't study peace, we just study conflict a lot more. And that is a problem because we are not able really to draw how do we preserve that. Um, so these are some of these, these are some of the things. Uh, but also it's it's worth keeping in mind that um, and I found it really uh, fascinating um, that um, of the of the evidence uh, conclude, I think of the World Bank research, around 87% of it go completely unsighted. And I think 31% is never even downloaded uh, from, from, from their website. So, you know, and also policymakers tend to tell you just throw research on me. It's not always, um, it's not always uh, strong, but our strategy in this, in this initiative is really to ensure that we don't leave any uh, stones unturned. Um, and this is why we're trying to create both this bottom-up pressure of, of voices and, and mass mobilization, but also having the empirical uh, evidence that shows that this is also the smart way to go about peace processes because this is what works and this is what does not work. Anyway, I can tell you more about this, but I think I've, I, I've talked quite a lot and I feel like maybe I've exhausted you with a lot of slides, but. 
Uh, just very, very quickly to let you know that right now we're starting this global process for the International Commission, and there will be a series of, of engagements where we try to capture the voices, um, both of practitioners, of policymakers, but also of average citizens and um, uh, you know, activists and um, yeah, there'll be, I mean, you'll see here, we have, uh, you know, some of the constituencies are parliamentarians, youth, women, religious and, and traditional leaders. And we're creating both incubation spaces, we're doing regional consultations, country consultations, but we're also starting a series of global open conversations that anyone can join and share their views and engage with the commission. So follow us actually if you're interested because you know I think you would be able to join, for example, some of the, the youth um, consultations, which will look both at sustainability and long-term solutions, at stabilization, at local ownership, at tools, at pluralism, at values and cultural integrity. So these are some of the uh, essential uh, initial themes uh, that we're engaging on. So this is a process that is happening now. It started um, I joined my current role in, in August, we've set it up and we've launched it in January and we will come up with the new principles for peace uh, by the end of next year. And now we're just starting both the evidence process, uh, the distillation of evidence, but also these uh, country consultations um, and global consultations. So it's, it's very exciting, it's happening right now. And we're always inviting uh, different people to share their views, their ideas, they could share their videos, they could share their recommendations with messages to the commission. It's a very open uh, process. Okay, so I've covered this, so I'm just going to stop that. Um, so we'll just open for a few questions uh, from your side. Um, and then, yeah, we have around half an hour. Um, so if you have any questions, if not, I will have questions for you. So you better take the, you know, the steering wheel and hammer me, otherwise I'll hammer you. Okay, so since there are no questions, I'm gonna put up some questions for you. And I'd like you to take, um, actually you're not too many. Uh, Giovanni, are you with us or Maria? Okay, they're not. I was trying to see if I could actually put you in, in small working groups. All right, it seems I may not be able to. All right, so let's, let, let's do it individually. So I'm going to put a set of questions on the screen. I'd like you to take um, the coming um, five minutes to reflect on one or two questions. It's up to you which one, okay? Will you take five to 10 minutes maybe because they're quite complicated questions. And then after that we'll open and then please, um, uh, please come in. Feel free to, to put also some of your thoughts in the chat um, and to share with the others. So I'll just share with you the screen. So let's take the coming uh, 10 minutes to take a look at these based on everything you've heard, okay? All right. Sorry, Hiba. So we had to choose just one question. Yeah, I mean, take take one or two based on the time that you have. But you you're free to to choose any from any of the categories. Whether you're looking at the positive core, at the challenges and fears, or the hopes and aspirations for the future, on either of these. Ideally, if you have time and can take one and one and one from each category, that would be fantastic. If someone manages to do these three in the 10 minutes, that would be fabulous.
Okay, so two more minutes and then we'll open up. Okay. All right, so, um, great, so let's take some interventions. Uh, who would like to go first? Who would like to share with us? Otherwise, I'll just call randomly from my side. I can go if you want. Go ahead. Uh, so I just managed to um, um, to answer two questions. Mm -hmm. One is concerning the current challenges to social cohesion in my own community. Mm -hmm. And um, basically thinking also of what what we talked about today, I, um, I came across a couple of points. So I think one current challenge is the presence of discrimination of any kind. Uh, whether it be that um, racial discrimination, gender discrimination, uh, sexual orientation discrimination. Um, then I, uh, I, I thought of the generational division in, in more than in values, because if we think about my community, I could say that generational values can in a way be the same but it's more different in terms of the prospect to the future. So for instance, I, I thought of what you were mentioning related to the, um, uh, to the business, the social change uh, rather than profit. And I can see that, for instance, if we talk about um, uh, the relation to the environment or the relation mm -hmm. to climate change, the, the, um, the position that, uh, for instance, um, uh, people like my parents um, have a different prospect or a different attitude towards the issue. Um, and then uh, personally, uh, I feel there is a lack of sense of community in terms of a sense of belonging, but that can be subjective, um, which eventually can also lead to this lack of cohesion that could possibly come together and uh, work, to work towards um, the creation and the, the reach of justice. So if we think about uh, discriminations, for instance, and the, present, the challenge of inequalities, uh, the fact that we are lacking this uh, sense of community that of people that don't come together to work and try to solve a, a common issue or something that is bugging in the community, um, I think it's also due to the sense of belonging that may, might be lacking. 
And um, lastly, um, all comes back also to a sense of lack of like lack of trust uh, towards the system. Um, specifically, I feel that in Italy um, there's a common uh, there can be a common distrust in the system. Things don't work. Uh, we pay taxes and we don't get services. Um, institutions work on their own. For instance, politicians do their things, and this is exa exacerbated also uh, in the grassroots gra grassroot level. And lastly. Uh, I answered the, um, what does societal peace mean in a specific context, and basically it's the opposite of all these things that I mentioned. So um, uh, related to the positive peace uh, concept, so going beyond the conflicts and trying to reach justice, uh, equality, uh, non-discrimination, and uh, yes, well, receiving. Great, wonderful. These are great, great points. Uh, anyone else would like to share? All right, so Maral, why don't you tell us some of your ideas? Can you, are you in a place where you can talk? I guess not. Sara? You've unmuted yourself, but we cannot hear you for some reason. Oh, strange. The, there's like no microphone. I think uh, uh, your microphone is not set up correctly. Okay, so there's no problem. Maybe share with us in, in writing. Ali, what about you? Are you there still? You've also unmuted yourself, but <laughs> we can't hear you. What's up, guys? You don't do like online learning? Why are why are your microphones all screwed up suddenly? Sergio, go ahead. Yes, I can go. Uh, actually, uh, I'm with some colleague of mine, and rather than answering the question, we start discussing. We get kind of stuck in a discussion, um, trying to define a practical example of a. A society which is uh, it's like a, um, for example a country where the social society is and, and doing so we were trying to define uh, what, 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 that, what does this imply mm -hmm. um, so we are we have more questions than answer great share with us what you've discussed keen to hear that and let's try and answer it together now for example we were we were trying to my example could be France. To me, France as a it is a co co where the even the civil society when they have to to fight for something. For example, the the gilets jaunes you mentioned before, or um, any other uh, kind of protest manifestation, they act like as a, as a you know, very strong. Very, I can hear you. I'm just going to close my office door. It's getting like very compact and straight. But then it's interesting. So let me let me ask you ask you a question. I mean, when you've seen uh, when you've seen uh, for, um, like the, there are two, I think, events that happened recently in France, which were absolutely, you know, really interesting, which also put the question to what degree um, if, I mean, I assume you're looking at it more like an, as an idealistic, ideal, more ideal model. Um, I think the, the, the kind of the yellow vest uh, movement and how that was dealt with, I mean, in a way, yes, in terms of rights of assembly, and it's, it's quite interesting in terms of how the unions are set up and how people can actually demand uh, their rights. It's, it's very, very interesting. But what did you think about how that was handled and what does it display 
because the narrative was absolutely fascinating around that. Even you know when there was the the, the call, for example, to um, um, to increase the prices of fuel, and then it became this whole thing about the elites in urban areas versus the people who live in the more remote areas of France and how lack of that will affect their employability. And there's a lot of us and them. And then the other one, when it comes to about you know social cohesion, um, the whole issue about you know. Muslims in France, um, you know, the, the, the kind of the, the, the dress code, um, the, the narrative around that, the level of polarization around that. Does that make you think that maybe there are also some schisms there and maybe something that one should, you know, there's some like areas where, you know, both the government and the society should work on potentially. But we, yeah, we came to the same conclusion, actually, uh, also in also realizing, realizing that. that. Um, in a world that is going in a, um, uh, let's say, multicultural direction, where society uh, and countries are not closed anymore, thanks God, how can we aim to, to, to be one big, I don't know, social society, all unite, all sharing the same. I mean, that's, of course, we have to aim at it, but it's difficult. In my, in my opinion, the reality is that the small group inside the society are cohesive and fighting for, for their, uh, their interests. Mm. So that's, that's interesting. I mean, I think, I think you're, you're absolutely um, right in that sense, but also it's interesting to keep in mind that and I'm glad that you know you're thinking about different contexts. That when we think about peace, we need to think beyond the you know beyond the war-torn countries to start to think about societal peace in in different countries. Andrea, would you like to share with us? You've had you've had some thoughts that you've jotted down. Sorry, I, I didn't want to want to write in, write in the chat, but. I only want to take some notes, but it's okay. Um, well, I try to, to answer in the chat with the main challenge in the future, in my opinion. Uh, as, I, as I wrote, is about inequalities, because I think that maybe the conflicts or uh, similar conflicts could happen, can happen when there is some when there is inequalities, big inequalities from people in between people. So maybe uh, to answer with Ser following the Sergio thing, um, when uh, like friends, uh, friends or Europe, when rights are defended, are guaranteed to all the people, more or less, um, there is no possibility to, to reach a conflict. Uh, because I were I was in, in Colombia uh, two years ago, and there, uh, even if they starting with the peace treaty, all these things, there is no willingness uh, from political party, and there is no willingness from people from the cities to recognize the rural people, recognize the rights of rural people to live there and have their own their own society there. So mm -hmm. it is, this creates a conflict. Absolutely. And when, when we arrived in a place where people are not, and they have so many differences, it's a big deal to reach peace, I think. Absolutely. I think that's, that's a, a, a very uh, nice way to, to, I think, to end the conversation. I feel mission is accomplished because I was really hoping that we would leave the session with you taking a few notions on board. The notion of positive peace and negative peace and to think about peace, not only in the end, you know, with this absence of violence definition, but really to think about it in a more comprehensive way, in a more long term way, in looking at both of the structures of violence. I wanted to leave you with the idea that a peace process should not be in your mind uh, one as a political process, 
Um, I don't want you to think of peace processes as that group of people coming around the table discussing on the basis of elite bargains, but to, to consider because in the future career, you're going to be in our sector. So it's very important that we plant these seeds everywhere, that you start to think about the processes. When we talk about peace process, we think about the processes of realizing and sustaining peace. And all that comes with that and going deep enough in addressing the historical uh, uh, the historical and the root causes of the conflict, to addre addressing grievances, to addressing questions of equality, the questions of trust in institutions, really also nipping in the bud the structures and institutions of violence. And to think about it, that also it's not based on these only elite bargains that end up um, making violence the main currency. And Andrea, your, your example, for example, in Colombia, this is what happens when you have an elite bargain where the main negotiations is not are not and although Colombia seems to be one of the more inclusive processes but still has a lot of issues uh, that actually are not laying the foundations for more uh, areas of social peace the points that both um, uh, you you were raising and also the points that you Ricardo put in, in around health and and education and all of these rights. So, um, so I think mission is accomplished because all of your examples are are there. I hope you enjoyed our session. Um, you were all very very uh, um, uh, uh, efficient in in your answers, and I hope that in the future we will have. I'll see you and I'll hear your news of where you've made it in your career. So best of luck, and I think we might have one more session later um, for those who are in, um, I think all of you are from the Pavia program. So yeah, we'll have a session on career counseling, which um, Ali has done last year with, with me. So we'll talk more about your career paths and uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions and uh, to discuss with you options of both entry into the international organizations and like some of the choices I've learned throughout, you know, my 20 years of career um, with, the, with the system and now outside of it. So happy to be outside of it. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give my, uh, my cynicism of, of the system. I had great time in the system and did great things there. So I'll, I'll, in that session, I'll be less critical of the system and just be more uh, factual from a career perspective. Okay, so don't worry, I'm not gonna convert you not to want to join the system, okay? But great to talk to you all. I hope you enjoyed it um, and, um, and we'll have a chat. And if any of you feel inspired to do something relating to this initiative, go online, check it out. And they're really practical ways. We were very keen to, to, to really amplify voices and anyone can actually bring in a message or join one of these open consultations that are on any of these themes. So if you wish to, you're very welcome to. And uh, so this is an open invitation. All right. Take care and good to see you all. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye.